privilege and pleasure to be bringing to you the 21st of the William G. Anderson Slavery to Freedom Lecture Series. This uh, series emanates from a growing desire on the part of Michigan State University, its College of Osteopathic Medicine, the members of the administration, faculty, and staff, all of whom want to engage the community in addressing the many problems that yet exist in going to that ultimate position of the perfect union. But this lecture series will bring to campus people who are actively involved in helping us to become a better place for all to live and to find that ideal that is a more perfect union. Thank you for joining us in this effort. The first time she returned was for her man. He refused to go with her when she ran. Thought her insubordinate for believing she had a right to her freedom. Since he felt he had his, Hers could only come between them. Furthermore, his good white folks, they needed him, so he would, of course, stay. Yet she came back for him anyway, wanted to show him how to turn his love around, but what she found was her replacement in her husband's heart and bed. So she rescued her brothers and sisters instead. They talked with her, they walked with her, they fought with her through woods and rivers and catches with guns. Through cellars, through horseshit, through failing convictions, through 1,258 miles through injured feet and fear. Through unlimited trial, she led them to the home she prepared and told them they were now free. If only they dared to be. Then she turned around a second time and went back for her parents. So when I get tired of being in these trenches, I recall my ancestral mother, Harriet's queen at Aminta Tupman, in her third and fourth times when she dug these ditches, setting up rescue and reconnaissance missions, covert networks into the true axis of evil, unshackling the ankles and the consciousness of her people. And when I get discouraged by the ignorance, the hatred parading is innocence, the racist ideologies which insist and persist, I recall her fifth and sixth times when she showed who had the mastermind, for Massa's mind could never fathom her plans for travel, nor her methods of escape. And when I break in my commitment and start acting like I don't know why I was sent, I recall how her seven, eighth, and ninth times were spent trying to convince in prison psyches they were capable of releasing their chains. She said she could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. That's why when I'm scolded by the scared Or when chumps so weak they hump their backs when I speak Start shushing me looking over their shoulders for the police I pay homage to her 10th, 11th, and 12th time When snitches and slave catchers both bit her bullet Made a $40,000 bounty her whole card and still couldn't pull it Not even during her 13th time when they swore they found her weakness But since her commitment was only to God and the struggle her weakness didn't exist It was only a myth and for every occasion, when I'm impatient with children, I bring to mind her 14, 15, and 16 times when she served as a constant reminder of the motherhood of God, a relentless fighter, her entire being involved, fending off starvation and dogs with her bare hands, determined that even if she had to fall, our children would still stand. And for those infrequent days when I'm just feeling lazy, thoughts of her 17th and 18th journeys bombard me because I know that we who believe in freedom, we cannot rest. Our people are entitled to our best, to offer less is detrimental. We demean ourselves, our past, and our potential. And for those of us who believe the revolution is in our words, well, we're just wrong. Most of us don't even have 19 well-crafted poems. We honor not our peers, our elders, nor our ancestors in the craft. Spit like we got a masterpiece when it's just a rough first draft. So when I suppose sometimes that I'll stop writing, 
starts off our 19th journey, they hit me like lightning because I know I was born to convince y'all if we can't be serious about anything else, we should at least be serious about fighting. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final night of the 2021 William G. Anderson Lecture Series, Slavery to Freedom, an American Odyssey. I am Marita Gilbert. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Campus Inclusion at the College of Osteopathic Medicine here at Michigan State University. What an honor it has been to be entrusted with this series uh, 19 times. I marvel at the incomparable force of genius and brilliance that is Asali Devon Ecclesiastes, who opened our program this evening by sharing her gift with us virtually. She is a spoken word artist, community builder and strategist, inimitable wise one, and executive director of the Ashe Cultural Arts Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. With all of her accolades and responsibilities, I cannot thank her enough for being my super great big sister from another mister and for always showing up, not only for me, but for her willingness to be of service to this work. Let us commemorate those who have come before us by reading the following land acknowledgement. Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We pause in this moment to honor those whose lives and labor were exploited and lost in the practice of enslavement and in struggles for freedom on the land on which we sit. We acknowledge that their presence made it possible for ours. We pause to acknowledge all that has made it possible for us to live, learn, and work in this space. And now an introduction of our speaker. Dr. Cornell West is professor of the practice of public policy, public philosophy, I'm sorry, at Harvard University and professor emeritus at Princeton University. Dr. West graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained his MA and PhD in philosophy from Princeton. He has written 20 books and has edited 13. He is best known for his classics, Race Matters, Democracy Matters, and for his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. His most recent book, Black Prophetic Fire offers an unflinching look at 19th and 20th century African-American leaders and their visionary legacies. Dr. West co-hosts the weekly Tightrope podcast with Dr. Trisha Rose, welcoming listeners and guests as thought collaborators with revered hosts and public intellectuals. Dr. West is a frequent guest on The Bill Maher Show, CNN, C-SPAN, Democracy Now!, the list could continue. He has a passion to communicate to a vast variety of publics in order to keep alive the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., a legacy of telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice. I am elated to be joined tonight by a blues man in the life of the mind and a jazz man in the world of ideas. Dr. West, welcome back to Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Oh, what a blessing to be back. All the wonderful people engaged in magnificent work and witness trying to ensure that each life they touch results in a form of empowerment and ennoblement. Yes. and allow us to be able to work together, to be in dialogue with you, my dear sister, Dr. Marina Gilbert. I want it's to thank good. you. Thank you so very much. I salute the Dean. Uh, 
Al okay. Muffetano, I think his name was. Al Muffetano, you practiced? Yes, oh yes, he's a good brother. He's a good brother. There was another dean too that I had a chance to talk with. So you got he, to his, talk to Dr. Anderson. Well, well, no, there was another dean as well because- Oh, oh Dr. Madison, yes. Yes, oh. that, that's exactly, I want to acknowledge him, but no, not Brother Anderson now, I want to just take some time with because uh, you talking about high quality service. Someone who exemplifies a longevity and integrity and tenacity and still is as strong as ever, mm -hmm. Dr. William G. Anderson. That's what we're here to acknowledge and to zero in and keep the focus on our precious younger generation of all colors, but we're going to highlight those who come from the chocolate side of town, given that this is a black history, but black history is always not just American history, not just modern history. It is human history. And it allows us to connect with each other at the lower frequencies of our humanity, even given all of the various divisions that separate us too readily. So Dr. West, I let me tell you, I hate that we can't be together this evening, but if last time was any indicator, now you know we would have been caught up in a conversation about life uh, and music. Tony Morrison philosophy. Yes. That was in Pittsburgh, wasn't it? That's right. And we'd be enjoying yes. a good old beverage and losing track of time. So now listen, we are joined <laughs> by some old friends and new. So we got to stay on track a little bit tonight. All right. Just, just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. We go by the spirit of Michigan State University. Okay, we go we by the spirit. Quiet. There so you go. now listen, this is the official time when we celebrate Black histories and Black futures, right? So um, in my own practice, I believe that's really about naming history makers who have been significant to me and my, my life and work, who've made a way for me. Um, and I really try to just give gratitude um, for our ancestors, right? And so... I say that acknowledging that some of our ancestors, you know, walk before us and some of them still walk among us. Now, uh, Miss Ecclesiastes, who opened us tonight with that meditation on Harriet Tubman, the general. Is that I, powerful or what? Listen, I, I am moved every time I hear her recite that piece. And, you know, when well, I she's think she's such about a her, great artist, though, you know, is. you can just feel the way in which her spirit her language, her eloquence, the music is all interwoven in such a way that it touches us at the very deep level. And you know, I come from a tradition where the spirit will not descend uh -huh. without song. It won't descend without some lyrical and musical rendition. Similarly so with Brother Holly. Mm -hmm. He was sounding good. He sound good. To have both of them together, that's a dynamic duo. duo. Listen, listen dynamic now. Dynamic duo. We're going to honor the ancestors tonight and listen. So I think about that, right? And so I'm going to invite you to do the same. But when I think about ancestors who um, guide me uh, today, I think I'm, I'm thinking about educators, right? Um, and mm -hmm. intellectuals, both formal and informal. So I'm going to share two with you. And then I'm mm -hmm. going to ask, while I'm talking, I want you to think about those who influence you. So the first that comes to mind for me is Septima Clark, who um, really understood that we couldn't vote if we couldn't read the ballot, right? So I think of her, about her work um, and about her thinking creatively to teach adult literacy, using things like um, shopping catalogs to teach people how to read. I think about her losing her job, her teaching job after refusing to disassociate herself with the NAACP and then yet remaining staunchly committed to teaching and to social justice, right? I think about her directing the citizenship school program uh, at the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. So she had joint focus on literacy and voting rights. Um, and I think the message that I get from her, the guidance I get from her is her ability to transform her community by using what she had, right? Absolutely. Using um, what she had to envision something more than what existed at the moment. So that's the first. The second, I got to tell you, and I think we talked about this the last time we were together. Um, I'm thinking of Zora Neale Hurston, 
who Ooh, yeah. refused to confine herself to the academy or its limited perceptions of scholarship, right? I, I am moved by her decision to be unapologetically centered on the lives, the experiences, the tradition, the folk wisdom of Southern Black folks, right? Um, having conducted research in Florida and Haiti, not too far from my mother's home in New Orleans in the neighborhood of Algiers. Um, for me, their eyes were watching God was one of the greatest gifts any teacher had ever given to me because I think it was probably the first time I saw myself as the focus of a text and as the focus of curriculum. Right. And so as I grew into my own Black feminist thought and praxis, I feel like Hurston is challenging me to show up fully and authentically to this work and exhorting me to connect intellectualism, which I'm sure you'll talk about, um, to a real practical advocacy, right, that centers, that speaks to and improves the conditions of those who are most marginalized. Uh, as I think about the two of them, um, my eighth grade teacher popped into my mind, uh, my, my eighth grade English teacher, Miss Patricia Ward, who introduced me to myself through the writings of Hurston. And of course, you and I always talk about Toni Morrison and Sonia Sanchez. Mm -hmm. And Miss Ward is probably, for me, the living bridge between Clark and Hurston, because I think she embodies a people-centered pedagogy. Right, this intellectualism in the service of visionary community empowerment. So now I, I did the first part, but I'm going to ask you who are the, the history makers, the ancestors who've had significant influence on your life and your work? Mm, no, that was eloquent. That was powerful. Well, actually, I, I began a little bit closer to home, my dear sister, which is to say I began with my mama. Mm -hmm. And I began with my father who passed in 1997. I'll never, ever be the human being that either one of them were. Uh, I, I, Mom's still going, thank God, but I, I still will never catch up with her greatness. Uh, and I say that because, as you know, anytime we talk about individuals, be they icons, heroes, be they less known, that they are waves in a greater ocean. And therefore, we always begin acknowledging the debt that we paid to those who came before. That's the Sankofa. Mm -hmm. You're always looking back to connect to the best of the past before we move forward in order to authorize a better future rooted in the present based on the best of the past. Mm -hmm. You bring those three dimensions of time together, past, present, future. And so when you, you talk about Zora Neale, you know, I think of Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. you know, I think of Curtis Mayfield. I think of Donnie Hathaway. I okay, think of Martin yeah. King. I think of Malcolm X. I think of Prathia Wynn out of Albany, Georgia. I think Brother Henderson tell you about that. She was one of the greatest preachers ever. She was mm -hmm. the one who gave Martin the language of I Have a Dream down in Albany. Right even before he got a chance to take it public. See, these are they who in the face of chronic hatred become love warriors. Mm -hmm. In the face of terror, they decide not to terrorize people back, but to call for freedom for everybody, freedom fighters. These are they who are traumatized psychically, physically, but become wounded healers rather than wounded hurters. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that particular strand that in, in the Black freedom tradition of the great love warriors, the great freedom fighters, the great wounded healers, they love truth, they love beauty, they love goodness, mm -hmm. love mercy. Many of them love God. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian myself, uh, but you don't have to be a Christian. Christians have no monopoly on acting right. Christians have no monopoly on courage. Uh, uh, and so when we think of ourselves, we always wanna situate and locate ourselves in that family network, that's Clifton and Irene, in, that, mm -hmm. in, in the larger extended family. Sly Stone says it's a family affair, right? Mm -hmm. It's an extended 
family in, in church for me, Shiloh Baptist Church on the Chocolate Side of Sacramento, California. Reverend Willie P. Cook, Deacon Hinton, head of the Deacon Board. Sarah Ray's head of my vacation Bible school. And what are they telling me? Lil West, no matter what you do in life, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. Mm. What kind of heaven behind can I leave? Critically, think for myself. Prophetically, tell the truth. Not just truth to power. Tell the truth to everybody. Mm -hmm. Tell the truth to myself. Sometimes that's the most difficult thing. Okay. You know what I mean? Telling the truth to Ooh. yourself. Oh, yes. Tell the truth to black folk. Tell the truth for the elite at the top. Tell the truth for folk in the middle. Tell mm -hmm. the truth at Harvard. Tell the truth at Michigan State University, Lansing. Even tell the truth to a magnificent dean, Sister Dr. Gilbert herself. The <laughs> condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, See, that's the tradition. And so when we think of our heroes and our heroines, you know, what is it about Harriet when she sang that song 19 times? She loved the people so. That's right. Willing to pay the cost. Willing to die. And that's mm -hmm. a cost. That's, that's a, a major cost. cost. Major cost. It's a cost. It's a burden. But she did it with joy. Now, she happened to be, of course, a revolutionary Christian. Mm -hmm. And I'll never be one-tenth of the human being she was. But I'll never forget the standard that she set. Yeah. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like so if I'm doing my home, Louis Armstrong gonna set the standard. I know they ain't gonna be Louis. Miles knows that. Went knows that. Clark Terry knows that. Roy Elridge knows that. Clifford Brown know he ain't gonna be Louis, but they lift their voices just like the anthem that Brother Holland sang. You lift your voice. Yeah. You sing your song. So it is as a doctor. Charles Drew and the others they gonna set a high standard. Mm -hmm. That's all right. You find your voice, and you That's ascend right. to greatness. So Dr. West, I want to talk about freedom movements for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So young people have always been instrumental in freedom movements, right? So if I That's think right. about the freedom rides in 1961, most of the freedom riders were between 18 and 30 years old. Um, I think also about uh, the Children's Crusade in Birmingham, Alabama in May of 1963, right? I Listen, I, I can't it's even true. imagine thousands of children, of black children walking out of school, marching to downtown Birmingham, or as it was called when I was a little girl, Birmingham, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then being hauled off to jail in, of all things, a school bus, right? In school buses. Exactly. That, that's, exactly. that's unimaginable for me, right? And then the next day, having hundreds more show up only to be greeted by Sheriff Bull Connor, and fire hoses and dogs, right? And so I think about that as a legacy um, to what we have seen um, at the inception of Black Lives Matter. And even again this summer in response to the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others at the hands of the police. You know, um, Black Lives Matter really inspiring young people to take to the streets all over the world. So tell me, about the energy of young people. What, what is it that makes young people so critical to freedom movement? Well, one is that when they awaken, and by awaken, what I mean is when they are able to see clearly mm -hmm. what is going on around them in their community, in their world, when they're able to think critically about what is going on, when they're willing to act courageously to change what is in place. Then they have that vitality, energy, vibrancy, but they must have vision, they must have courage, and most importantly, coming out of the Black Freedom Movement, given the standards that we got, you've got to have integrity. Mm -hmm. You've got to have consistency. So we're not talking about you know, being woke as a fad of a fashion. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And if you walk all the time, you're going to suffer from insomnia. That's right. You see, so you got to pace yourself. You got to be a long distance runner so that you're using your sensitivity, your integrity, and most importantly, your deep love, care, and concern for others who are suffering. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters in the prison, in the hood, on the block, on the corner, 
dealing with decrepit schools, inadequate education, low quality uh, 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 housing, and not enough jobs with a living wage and so forth. You see the poverty and the near poverty. That's in order to be great in the black freedom struggle, you have to be someone who is willing to see with vision, speak with courage, act with consistency, and most importantly, serve and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason why black artists are usually the vanguard of the movement. Just like we, we saw with Sister Ecclesiastes and Brother Holland, what was, what was distinctive about them? Well, one, they were not just ornaments or, or, or decorative figures. They are part and parcel, they're constitutive, they're integral to our conversation. That they are on a continuum with what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The way he sang, the way he gave of himself, mm -hmm. the way our dear sister rendered that poetry with all of the syncopation and the blues elements and the swing and, 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 and the rhythms, all of this is a way of trying to open our souls in such a way that we could be what John Coltrane called a real force for good mm -hmm. together, together. Embracing all peoples. I mean, we know that the, the love that black people produce has always embraced everybody, but it begins on the chocolate side of town because you got some black people love everybody but black people. Well, you see, that's, that's a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. Something, something just ain't right on that. You got to be to love yourself, to respect yourself. Don't put up with disrespect, but at the same time, respect others. But you have to respect yourself and love yourself in order to love and respect others. Of course, that's biblical. To love thy neighbor as thyself. And to, you know, in, in a society deeply shaped by white supremacy, it tries to convince black people we're less beautiful, we're less moral, we're less intelligent, that we ought to doubt ourselves, we ought to call ourselves into question, or every day of our lives, we are in a perpetual audition mm -hmm. in the eyes of a white mainstream. And you say, no, that's not where Brother Holland and Sister Ecclesiastes come from, that's right. not at all. They have a point of reference that is that constitutes peoples who love and affirm them. They still, all of us need to grow, all of us need to mature. So it's still a critical response, but it's not looking to the white mainstream for approval. It's not looking through the white normative gauge for some kind of elevation. No, greatness comes from he or she who has a scope of love, a scope of service, a willingness to sacrifice. That's what greatness is. And that's different than success. So let me let me stick with freedom movements for a second. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Black women are often written out of histories, right? Uh, there's an erasure of our presence, dismissal of our contributions, general disregard for our experiences. Now, in Black Prophetic Fire, you highlight Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and Ida B. Wells as some of the most profound thought leaders and activists uh, of the American freedom enterprise. I've also heard you assert, and we can talk about this, that the next uh -huh. wave, especially of high quality leadership will be disproportionately women. Absolutely. I, I think we've seen that um, pretty That's recently, true. right? So if we think about the Stacey Abrams and the Tasha Browns and Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, I could keep you know listing folks, but I think you follow me here. Talk about the role of Black women's leadership and organizing to freedom movement. Well, I would add Marie de Gilbert. I mean, it's a whole wave of figures, voices coming out of the best of our tradition, where, where in the past there's been so many sexist and patriarchal constraints. Mm -hmm. You see, so Ella Baker couldn't ascend to where she belonged because of the sexism in, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the civil rights movement, see? Everybody knew she was a towering figure. Prathia Wynn, who I mentioned from Albany, who I used to travel the country with, one of the great preachers. She was not given her due. Mm -hmm. So Tima Clark, who you mentioned, Diane Nash, we can go on and on. Of course, Rosa Parks people know about. Right. Because of she, she, she constituted the catalyst 
uh, her act of courage constituted the catalyst. But now that some of the sexist barriers are being uh, uh, pushed back, we're getting this overflow of black woman's genius, talent, courage, vision, and so forth. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. And it also goes, goes to our precious gay brothers and uh, precious lesbian sisters and precious trans and precious non-binary that they've always been part of the black community. I know when I was growing up in Shallow Baptist Church, everybody knew who was gay, knew who was lesbian and so forth. It was on the down low, nobody talked about it. These days, people are willing to raise their voices and rightly so. But no matter who we are, whatever our sexual orientation, gender or color, we still have to choose mm -hmm. courageously integrity, honesty, decency, courage, vision, service, sacrifice. And that's why any talk about identity, skin color and so forth, it doesn't cut deep enough if it's not cutting at the level of moral integrity, mm -hmm. spiritual tenacity, and global solidarity, which cuts across race, cuts across region. I would argue it cuts across national boundaries. So our brothers and sisters in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Europe, in Asia, Antarctica, I know there got to be some brothers and sisters up there we hunt hard enough, all straight. It's a global thing. And this has always been part of our movement. Mm -hmm. The ways in which the, our particularity building on our R-O-O-T-S, our roots, unleashes a universality that allows our R-O-U-T-E-S, our routes, to mm. take us to every corner of the globe. So do you think we've just um, evolved, the, that freedom movements have evolved in such a way that there are some things that are no longer a question, right? But that, that's an expected starting place. Do you think that's, that's where we are? Well, I think so many of the young uh, leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement do assume right. so much based on what Martin did, based on what Fannie Lou Hamer did, based on what Ella Baker did, based on what Malcolm X did. They've had access, they studied, they're grounded in it, but then they're also looking in a digital age. They're looking at organized greed at the top. They're looking at institutionalized hatred on the right wing. They're looking at the ways in which our families and our communities have become so commodified. Everything's for sale, everybody's for sale, hard to know who you can trust. People too often just wanna be celebrities and status and have money rather than use whatever they have to be of service to the least of these. Mm -hmm. That's a biblical formulation, 25th chapter of Matthew. What you do to the least of these, the prisoners, the poor, the persecuted, the subjugated, you see. That's the spiritual standard. And we get that from the genius of Hebrew scripture, spreading that hesed, that steadfast love and loving kindness to the orphan, the widow, the stranger, the neighbor, the subjugated, the persecuted. So that Jesus as a Palestinian Jew comes right out of prophetic Judaism with that kind of message. That's why he goes straight to the temple. What right. does he do in the temple? Runs out the money changer. That, that temple was, was yeah, the biggest, I... biggest edifice east of Rome. 500 Roman troops on one side, the bankers in the center, the intellectuals rationalizing the policies of robbing the poor. Jesus goes right in, the disciples say, we hadn't planned on this. This a little bit too much. He's going to get us crucified. Well, he got him crucified, but why? It wasn't out of hatred was not a revenge. He was loving poor people. Mm -hmm. Well, was, you know, was, I could stay here with you for a minute, but you know, no, we got yeah. to press on. No, no, so no, now, I see. I um, see. I see. Okay, so Dr. West, this has been some kind of week for you, I am sure. And I want to discuss tenure and promotion, but I want to discuss it more broadly, right? So in uh, written, unwritten, diversity and the hidden truths of tenure, Patricia Matthew documents um, the historically and systemically tenuous nature of navigating promotion and tenure for those of us who are underrepresented in the academy. 
Now, Dr. Lomax, who joined us um, the last time we convened, yes, um, yes. is the Foundational Associate Professor of African American and African Studies here at Michigan State and co-founder of the Feminist Wire. So she, she's written about this. So she's offered data documenting the paucity of underrepresented faculty who receive tenure. And I think the most troublesome part um, of that article is that the data reveals that this tenure system consigns particularly black women, women of color to contingent, right? These temporary non-tenure track and adjunct positions. So uh, Ruth Zambrana's book, uh, Toxic Ivory Towers also builds on that work, right? And so she notes these disproportional burdens and increased expectations of invisible labor and service that are again, uh, more frequently carried by women of color and black women. Now, while no less accomplished, often black women find themselves locked out of pathways to tenure track position mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the securities that tenure affords more frequently than any other group. Um, what I think is also important about both of those texts is that they speak to the harm caused by the system as it exists. So help me with this, right? So Black mm. people have long thought that education would be a pathway to liberation, right? right, Dr. Wilson, right. What is the conversation that we should be having about Black folks in academe and the tenure system? Mm, no, I appreciate that. And you can answer this with me. We can wrestle together on this because you can teach me on this. But I think, you know, it begins with Malcolm X when he said that if white elites mm -hmm. or white brothers and sisters of whatever position, if they have a massive disrespect of brother, brother Jamal and sister Letitia in the hood, mm -hmm. there's a very good chance that they're gonna disrespect me too. And I shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking just because I got a PhD or I'm a professor or so forth, that I'm somehow gonna be exempt. Mm -hmm because we're on a continuum in that sense. So we have to fight for the respect of everybody. Now, as a Christian, I always begin with the least of these. If they respect folk in the hood, in the working classes and so forth, then you come up all the way to Michigan mm -hmm. State, Harvard and so forth. Now we individually have to make our choices to the degree to which we're not going to be disrespected and devalued and dismissed, but we have to be, all able also to have ties and webs together to be able to talk about this together so we can preserve our sanity and our mm -hmm. dignity because it's, you have constant bombardment. It also means then that let's say in the university, universities reached a point where they talk about diversity and inclusion and equity, fine. We wanna make sure it's not a superficial discourse. Yeah. We wanna make sure that there's a translation on the ground and translation on the ground means sharing of power. You've got to have the persons around the table who are making decisions be a variety of different perspectives, mm -hmm. sensibilities, colors, gender, sexual orientations, and so forth. You see. So that sharing of power is different than just inclusion within a hierarchy where, where folk at the very, very top are still very much like the National Football League. You, you got all the owners, vanilla for the most part, and then one black coach, brother, brother Tom, and then the other, and the players are mainly black. Now, we're talking about the sharing of power across the board. That is a democratizing, which is much deeper than just diversity. That's more John Dewey mm -hmm. than it is contemporary discourses of diversity. So, I mean, so here's what I'll, I'll offer to that, right? Absolutely. Think, um, so much like you talked about the shift, right, um, in freedom movements, right, that there are some things that are no longer questions, but rather expectations. I think part of that is what has to also happen in higher education, right? Mm. That is mm. not a question um, that we must not just have diversity numbers, right? That, you know, I can take stock and, and, and um, evaluate differences, right? But we're really doing the work of inclusion and not just because we thought it was a good idea and we wanted to be in the in crowd during one summer, right? That's right. But because it is something that we are legitimately committed to. And 
you know, it has to happen, right? So part of what what I what concerns me is, um, you know, not those those who are actually in tenure track positions, right? But for people who are always relegated to the lower part of the hierarchy, right? They're always adjunct. They're always fixed term, right? They're always non-tenure track. We know several things. It depresses their salary potential, right? That's if they're right. heads of household, right? It has implications for quality of life. And, and let's just be honest, Dr. West, the other piece of that is, uh, what is it? Mary Frances Winters writes about black fatigue. It literally can kill you. Oh yeah. Right? Absolutely. And so, um, and so when Absolutely. we talk about this thing, right? These this this disproportionate experience, you know, it's a real thing. And, and I think, you know, part of why I asked you about what is the conversation we should be having, not the one that sensationalized because, you know, um, the media has now jumped on the bandwagon, but when we then go into executive leadership meetings, when we speak to our boards of trustees, what are the things that we should be talking about? And I don't know that we have the answer here tonight, but it is that open question about um, if we are ever becoming our better and greater selves, what is it that we should be thinking about? What's that next conversation? Not the conversation that we had 20 years ago, but what's the conversation that's right. gonna take us 20 years ahead? And see, that's where I start with the sharing of power. Mm -hmm. That's deeper than just diversity, but it's the sharing of power precisely because it allows us to be more true to the mission of the university. The university is in place in order to pursue truth and knowledge and beauty. Mm -hmm. And when you share power and have a variety of different persons and perspectives, then you're allowing the one condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak Another condition of truth is lift every voice. And we're not talking about echoes. See, our anthem not lift every echo. See, the Johnson brothers from Florida, they knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. They don't just want people to just extend some echo chamber. They want people to find their voice, be critical, to be willing to take a risk, and then share power. Why? So our students will be empowered. That's the reason why we're here. That's the reason why we teach. It's a special vocation, a special calling to be able to empty ourselves, to be able to give of ourselves to our students, what happens when our students come in class and mm -hmm. feel as if their realities are not being addressed. So too often then they're being disempowered. Now students must take responsibility too. What does that mean? They got to be rigorous, doing their homework, doing their reading, having conversations, even as they deal with the pandemic, even as they deal with whatever they're circumstances are at home and whatever the socioeconomic conditions are, but they come in prepared. Then they have the teachers who also deeply care. Then you have administrators who are trying to ensure that they go beyond just the diversity dialogue that we've had in the last 20 years, but have a sharing of power. Why? Because in the end, by your fruits, you shall know them, which is what? The students will be empowered well not just when they're here but when they i mean we're we're we are teaching them or we are modeling for them that's right how to be professionals right and so now you know we now we could stay here for a minute that's, but, I'll, that's exactly I'll right. no, our next right. but how to be professional how to be citizens and how, how to be better human beings yes, how to run their own boards how to exactly. run their own businesses how to be you know um successful in um, as researchers, all of those things. So absolutely. I'm gonna shift a little bit, Dr. West. You um, were a part of Dr. Henry Louis Gates' recent documentary about the black church. Oh, yeah. 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 So talk a little bit about the relationship between the black church and social justice advocacy. Well, the black church is unique in the history of black folk because it it it, it anti- mm -hmm dated the family. You know, our families, of course, were shattered because our precious children and mothers and fathers were sold in slave auctions in various parts of the country. So it was very, very difficult to sustain strong family. But the church came in as a community and it had to be underground because it was against the law for black people to worship God without white supervision. Right, right. In the land of religious liberty. See the hypocrisy here. 
but we had to go underground anyway. Ring shouts, spirituals, preachers. Many preachers themselves were undercut. Yeah, they were mm -hmm. too free mm -hmm. reading the Bible. My mission is to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's Jesus. Cut that one out. Could you please read slaves be obedient to your master? That's that the oh, that's further that. Oh, I see. No, no, no. The black church at its best unleashed the love warriors and freedom fighters and wounded healers. That's where Martin King comes from. See, that's where Faith Your Wind comes from. That's where Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and Senior come from. We can go on and on, right? And at the same time, though, those churches had blind spots. Yes. Too sexist. They were too homophobic. Sometimes they were class conscious. Sometimes the middle class folk looked down on the poor black folk. You see, sometimes they were too coloristic. The little light skinned, sunshine, paperback brown black people looked down on beautifully black black people. All of those have been challenges in the black church, but mm -hmm. at its best, it has been the means through which we could preserve our sanity and dignity mm -hmm. and thereby continue a struggle for freedom and justice and equality. Yeah. And I think there's um, still room for us to grow, right? Uh, Absolutely. We, uh, to grow and evolve into who who the church is called to be in this moment in time so this is one of my favorite things to talk to you about dr west um so some people say the greatest act of resistance is to create or sustain and savor moments of black joy now when i think about black joy i hear uh you talked about uh elders in your life i hear the words of Miss Roberta, who was one of my church mothers. Mm. Um, and I understand black joy to be uh, a state of one spirit in spite of, even though, and just because, right? That's right, that's um, right. And I think we saw black joy on display as we watched black voters, you know, dancing and singing in these hours long lines um, that span for blocks, you know, um, at voting polls at home. In New Orleans, I think we see Black joy when we dance to the music of brass bands, right? Often, even through tears, as we send off our That's dearly true. departed loved ones. That's for true. Me personally, I'm gonna tell you, Black joy for me is running into the second line parade on Sunday Ooh. afternoon in New Orleans. Now that's black that's, joy. For that's me, black right? joy. That's deep black joy right there. Right? Um, I think it could also be the electric <laughs> slide or the wobble at the cookout. In my case, that's going to be the crawfish boil, right? <laughs> I think black joy is watching kids jump double dutch. That's black joy, right? I, I think for me, Black Joy is the Isley Brothers anytime for any reason. Anytime, the caravan of love. Or Black Joy can be here in Brother West and Raheem Devon on the same love ballad, right? So, Ooh, yeah, no, indeed. Now, that's a beautiful thing. It just put a smile on your face. It put does, even face. now. So, it's let's true. talk about the significance of Black Joy and why we should fight to protect it. Absolutely. The first thing we want to say is Black Joy is different than Black Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Black pleasure is nice, but pleasure does not cut deep enough because Black joy is, produces those enduring features that keep you going. Mm -hmm. The pleasure could be a little bit too ephemeral. It could be a little bit too episodic. It doesn't cut deep enough. So that I, I, my highest level of Black joy is seeing the sparkle in my mama's face when she yeah. smiles and talks yeah. about her past and talks about her present and embraces her great grandchildren see that's a joy that uh, i could never ever be taken away you see what i mean yeah. they could try to cut my head off literal assassination character assassination i'm going down with a smile because i got a joy the world can't take away you see yeah. and there's so many other kinds of black joys well you're absolutely right very very much so yeah. you see james brown moving across floor that's a whole lot cool. of black joy talk calling for bootsy to play soul power and stubberfield getting the drummer song and maceo intervening with his solo that's a whole lot of black joy right there yeah you know i think about 
Um, and I've been trying not to be selfish and talk about my own family, but you know, yes. yes. just a memory of my grandmother's hand pressed to my face, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's right? magnificent. So hearing my mama singing. That's powerful. Anytime. Now, was your mother, was she singing at home or in church or both? <laughs> both. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. So, and, oh, you know, uh, my daddy, just his smile or laugh, right? And so, again, this idea that we necessarily must protect Black joy. It is, it is our, part of our preservation. It is Absolutely. Us together, right? Absolutely. You know, Mahalia Jackson comes right out of Saint, out of New Orleans. Don't you know it? I uh, you know Chicago, they like to claim her. No, that's Church, New Orleans all day. New Orleans. <laughs> so now Dr. Armstrong Jackson. Armstrong on one side, and there's Mahalia Jackson on the other. <laughs> Jelly Road Martin. I mean, New Orleans is generate so much joy and genius. That's right. That's right. And now listen, now, now you know I'm gonna always talk to you intergenerationally now. We could talk jazz, but we could also talk about New Orleans bounce music, but we don't have that type of time, Dr. Oh, now you go to bounce music now. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Ooh, so, this leads me to my last question before we go um, to Q&A. And this is probably the most important thing that we're gonna talk about tonight. You ready? What's that? So the last time you and I were together, we got into a very serious conversation, okay? We, I think we agreed on Ella Fitzgerald and Aretha Franklin as probably the greatest vocalists and soul-stirring entertainers in American music. I think we agreed on that. Oh, we got one more. Which one, did, which one else? Divine Sarah. So, okay, I, I remember this, but do you remember that I pushed you to consider Jill Scott as an addition yes, from this generation? Yes, you did. Right, so now this last time we had this conversation, we were almost late getting to where we needed to be. So my question for you is, aside from your ultimate favorite, John Coltrane. That's true. Who have you been listening to recently? And what music is speaking to your spirit right now, getting you through? Curtis Mayfield. Curtis Mayfield. Mm -hmm. We are winner. Mighty, mighty spade and whitey. This is my country. If there's a hell below, we all gonna go. All the way up to the last album that he wrote when he was paralyzed from his neck down in Atlanta with Roger Troutman, our mm -hmm. computer man from uh, Ohio who worked with him. And uh, there he's talking about a beautiful world. He's about talking about a beautiful world. He's sitting there in a wheelchair, can't move from his neck down, sounding so good that you want to get up and start moving. It's like Teddy mm -hmm. Pendergrass in a wheelchair, too. And what is he singing about? Joy, joy to be. Joy to be. All right, now listen, after the pandemic, we really are going to have this two-step. I promise. <laughs> we're going to get together. We're going we're gonna to two-step. But now I need to open up our conversation <laughs> And as I, I share with you, um, our students from SNMA, our Student National Medical Association, um, would like to be in community with you. And so I'm going to turn it over to Brandon, Brandon Henry, um, who has uh, a presentation for you. And then Dow will follow him with a question. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dr. West, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, this evening. My name is Brandon Henry. I'm a second year medical student here at Michigan State College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I'm also the outgoing chapter president of the Student National Medical Association. So SNMA, uh, this is what the abbreviation is, uh, is committed to supporting current and future underrepresented minority medical students and increasing the number of culturally, uh, clinically excellent, culturally competent and socially conscious physicians. So um, in behalf of Michigan State and Dr. G and uh, all of us here, we'd like to present you with this token of our appreciation. Ooh, that's so beautiful, brother. I'm going to grab it. It's like I'm did you handed it right to my hand and I'm saluting you in your brilliance and your service to others. I can tell you that. Uh, so now I'm going to turn over to Dow, and I actually have a follow-up question after Dow gets her question. Absolutely. So where were you born and raised, my brother? Oh, uh, so I was born and raised in South of Michigan. Ooh, how far is that from where you are now? Uh, about, a, about an hour. Low, low okay, 
Yeah. Not too far. Mom and dad still strong as ever. Yes, they are. Uh, mom Ooh. calls me every day, you know, telling me about her day and uh, how she's happy that I'm kind of happy, happily going up, uh, along my path. So it's, I don't know. That's you what putting, a smile, kind of doing putting a smile on their faces, man. Putting a smile. That's that joy we talk about. Yep. That's that's a little bit of my joy. Yeah, you understand what we talk about. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate you, man. Salute you, though, brother. Good evening, Dr. West. Thank you for your time and your energy and for Dr. G to bring us all in together. Um, my question is in regards to the practice of medicine, particularly holistic medicine. And uh, one of the osteopathic tenets is that the person is a unit of body, mind, and spirit. And so I wanna ask you, how has the American health system seceded or failed to serve the person as a unit. And is there another element of human wellness that we're missing that we haven't seen um, as far? Mm -hmm. Well, first I wanna salute you, my dear sister. And I know you're a force for good already as well. Absolutely. But no, I mean, here I would have to just listen. I'd have to learn from yourself and others in terms of what it means to keep track of the whole person each person being unique and singular, but at the same time, each person being a member of a species that ought to bring us together. Uh, uh, I think that issues of hope become very important. Now you could talk about hope in terms of spirit, you can talk about hope in terms of heart, mind or body, but people have to have a confidence in themselves such that they're willing to fight for health, for their mental health, their psychic health. And they have to be equipped to do that because they can't do it by themselves. None of us can do it by ourselves. You see. And there, of course, the connection of family, the backdrop and the webs of support, the sympathy of empathy that's required. But I also think that uh, you see, we live in a society that just has too much organized greed running amok. And so when you get organized greed running, too, running overflowing, too often in any institution. It could be the church, it could be the mosque, it could be the temple, it could be the synagogue, it could be medical profession, it could be university. We all need money, markets are here to stay, absolutely, but at the same time, we've got to have some decommodified spaces, like we need decommodified values, like love and justice and trust and fidelity and integrity. So it is in terms of our institutional arrangements when it comes to healthcare. I mean, I spent much time with my dear brother, Bernie Sanders, right? So he's calling for decommodifying major portion, portions of the economy as it relates to healthcare. That's a challenge, it's experiment, but he's focusing on the least of these. He, he wants to make sure no human being in the richest nation in the history of the world is left out of the healthcare system. And I think that has a moral and spiritual force to it that is, it, it is crucial in that regard. And so it seems to me that both when you're thinking institutionally and structurally about healthcare and then how you approach each patient, keeping track of their preciousness, keeping track of their uniqueness, even using the most scientific and the most holistic way of ensuring that they can flower and flourish. Dr. West, Dr. West, can you quickly answer Brandon's question for me? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for being able to squeeze me in. I just want to, I'm trying to be really brief, but. So no, no, you take your time. We got time. We got time. There, we cool. <laughs> so a quote that I recently stumbled upon by the philosopher Seneca, uh, it kind of resonated with me and it said, life is very short and anxious for those who forget the past and neglect the present and fear the future. This, this quote kind of uh, fits with the cur current like political and social climate over the past year or so. And many of my peers have reached out to me in regards to trying to understand process and cultivate emotions on the topics and concepts that I personally have been taught or have experienced growing up. And I know in a previous interview, you've talked extensively about spirituality, morality, and uh, gratitude. And some of my peers are expressing cognitive dissonance uh, and a feeling of anxiousness and fear and even shame. Now, I understand it's not my responsibility to teach or educate as to say for these different topics, but what is the best way that I can assist them through this process of potential change 
and growth of understanding their own morality and spirituality, even when I'm still trying to grow and cultivate my own. Because I often find myself I'm one of one in these some of these spaces. Oh, it's a beautiful question. I'm going to show you this book right here. You see that? How to Die, Seneca. What your quote right in there, right there, brother. And maybe no, we didn't plan this. No, we didn't plan it. <laughs> just this just happened. You see, but what he's wrestling with is how do you stay on the tightrope of life in such a way that you can engage in a genuine quest for wisdom, but phronesis, a practical wisdom, so that you have a flexibility, so that you have an openness, so that you have a humility. And you recognize on the one hand, there's forces bigger than you, but on the other hand, you can still be a strong force for truth and goodness and beauty. And I, I believe, even as a Christian, I believe in listening to a variety of different voices. I mean, he's a pagan brother, right? He's a Roman pagan brother. I learned much from Roman pagan. You see? So that we have to be open. We can learn much from Muslims. We can learn much from Jews. We can learn much from Buddhists. We can learn much from Hindus and so forth. Learn much from traditional religions indigenous peoples, Africans and so forth. Yet in the end, we take a stand in terms of our own particular traditions, right? But I think the most important thing though, brother, is to be what you're talking about. To exemplify what it means and how you stay on that type rope of life. And that's what Seneca was able to do. He exemplified what he talked about. And that's what integrity is. That's what consistency is. Always willing to grow. Always willing to grow. So thank Does that you make sense? Dr. West. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, future Dr. Henry. Um, so Dr. West, I'm getting a couple questions um, about both the legacy and current status of the Poor People's Campaign. Oh, yeah. Um, so there are folks that are asking if you would engage with the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and then there's another question that says, uh, you've spoken before to the 14 policy priorities to heal the nation. How does a reprioritizing of economics affect black folks directly? Yeah, I come out of the legacy. I'm just a very small part of the legacy of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who said that we will never be able to sustain American democracy unless we hit head on poverty, racism in all of its forms, including sexism, homophobia militarism and materialism, all four of those. And what brother William Barber the second, he's the closest thing to Martin Luther King Jr. in the culture right now. He and Sister Thea Harris at the Union Theological Seminary, the great Union Theological Seminary. They are the co-leaders of the Poor People's Campaign building on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Hank, Lou Hamm and others, but especially King at the last few years of his life. And I'm very close to Brother Barber. I mean, we talk all the time. I've been at many of the teach-ins of the Poor People's Campaign. We pray together. We sing together. Uh, uh, I learned so much from him. He's younger than I am. I'm old school and he's kind of quasi uh, uh, middle school, you see. But he's a giant. Mm -hmm. But he's a giant because he represents the best of the Black freedom struggle that you, you and I were talking about. He mm -hmm. combines the love warrior, freedom fighter, and wounded healer. And, uh, uh, and in that way, I think all of us ought to take note of the 14 points, trying to make sure that the budget doesn't go disproportionately to the military, the budget doesn't allow for the tax cuts for the well-to-do and the corporations and work, working people are overburdened with not just a tax load, with, with debt and so forth and so on. All of those have to do with priorities. And our priority needs to be poor and working people. Mm -hmm. Our priority needs to be fighting any forms of racism, any ideology that loses sight of the humanity of others, mm -hmm. fighting organized greed, fighting indifference toward others. Rabbi Abraham Hesher used to say, indifference to evil is more invidious and insidious than evil itself. Mm -hmm. Hesher was part of Martin's, Martin King's project. They went hand in hand, you see. Yeah. And, and, and there were many others, the Daniel Berrigans and others, the Grace Box, Dorothy Day, Vanilla Sister, mm -hmm. white Catholic at the center of fighting against poverty right there with 
Martin King and others. That's the kind of coming together. That's the kind of solidarity that we need. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about your vision of the education system. How has it shaped the past and how could it change in the future? Well, the different levels of the educational system. I mean, there's a level of the curriculum. The curriculum has to be willing to tell some painful truths. You have to have dialogues on taboo issues, that you have to have a robust, respectful conversation of people of different perspectives, you know, conservative brothers and sisters, centrists, liberals, leftists. We have to all be able to be in classrooms together, on faculties together, and have a serious conversation and learn from one another. Because mm -hmm. we should forever be in process. We're forever growing and developing. But that's the level of curriculum. We've talked already about leadership and sharing of power, but then we got to make sure that our students have access to the best of us as teachers. We got to spend time, we got to exercise and show care and concern, and then make sure that they, they hit head on the curriculum mm -hmm. with their own discipline, do their homework, converse with each other, uh, and, and be a counterweight to the greed, the conformity, the callousness in the culture. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, you know, only 31% or so of, uh, of, of American citizens go to college at all. So you got 67% who, who really don't graduate and, and, and many of them don't go at all. So education has a connected high school, junior high, K through six. And education, of course, is not just in schools. Right, there's education in the music, there's education in the arts, there's education in the churches, in the mosques, the synagogues, the temples. There's education on television, media, education on social media, if you know what you're doing. Yeah, now that's a tricky one, Dr. West. That's I'm telling you, because there's a whole lot of misinformation, disinformation, yes. manipulation going on in social media. But you can, you can get educated if you know what you're doing, you know where to go. So the next question is, what do you think physicians' roles in the Black freedom movement should be? I, should, I think it is what it always has been, which is uh, an integral uh, role of doing what one is called to do, mm -hmm. which is to heal be the most rigorous kind of doctor and healer, and then be willing to contribute, given one's own distinctive gifts, mm -hmm. to whatever one thinks one can do best, to raise one's voice for the movement, to give money to the movement. Under certain conditions, yes, even hit the street. I don't think that ought to be a whole. You, we need some doctors to stay home to take care of folks. I was going to say, I think um, serving in underserved communities is one way to work for the movement. Absolutely. Think, um, Absolutely. To very young children and getting them interested in the profession. I think these are also good ways. Absolutely. And these days, you know, with, with the vaccine, you know, you got a lot of distrust among uh, precious Black brothers and sisters. Oh, yes. And so somehow we, we got to let them know that we understand the grounds of their distrust. The medical establishment has not been, been good to black people too often. Mm -hmm. But when we do know that those vaccines can be protective, we ourselves, we put ourselves at, in line first and then tell them it's working for me. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I want you to get in line because I don't want you to get this virus. So um, there is a question here about the current state of democratic civility among the young adult population within America. Um, could you speak to that? And I guess, what should we be doing? Well, part of it is, is that so many of our young brothers and sisters of all color, they looked at we older folk and saw that we didn't do that good a job. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? I mean, we just lost brother Rush Limbo, you know, and God bless his soul, God bless his family and everything. But 
he's not an example of, of democratic civility. He was the most popular, the most well-paid, the most influential figure in American public discourse. Mm -hmm. And look at the level that he enacted. It was very low level. I don't want to put him down now that the worm's got his body or nothing because I, 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 I fight for people's right to be wrong. But if young people, if that's what they're exposed to, then that's not a good example. We have to be examples and expose our young people to great examples of public civility across the board. So all the talk about cancel culture, we gonna cancel you out because we don't agree. Now you get into the canceling business, sooner or later the canceling gonna come to your house. <laughs> you gonna get canceled real quick, pretty soon. Next thing you know, everybody's canceled. Well, what's going on? Everybody's got faults. Everybody's got foremost accountability is what we need, not canceling. Accountability, how do we render each other accountable? Because people change. Yeah. People do change all the time. And we need to give them the grace and space to be able to do that, right? And we also have to demand or expect, right, that although you've made a mistake, now we we want you to now do better. We're calling to do something better and be higher. And let them know we've made mistakes in our lives. Mm -hmm. The only reason why we are who we are, somebody didn't cancel us. <laughs> now. So the next question is, as a young activist and minister of the gospel, I've come to a point where I believe that my purpose within ministry is to help bridge the gaps between race, faith, and justice. Uh, in saying in saying that, what do you believe are God's action plans in doing that? Also, how would you envision the Black church rewatering its roots within the soil of liberation theology and activism? Now you could you that's a whole book mm. right there. But now let's Ooh, see. I know, <laughs> I know. Good God Almighty! One is I just think we shouldn't make it too complicated. That uh, if someone's going to be a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. It means that you have got to be washed in the blood of the cross in such a way that you have undergone a change and transformation that allows you to be a free person, a free human being, a free black man, a free black woman, so that you're going to render service and allow nothing to get in the way of your love for other people. So you in the world, but not of the world. You're always cutting against the grain. You're not conforming, you're transforming. And in that way, whatever your particular gifts are, it could be, it could be different. You, know, you could mm -hmm. be a poet, you could be a singer, you could be on the deacon board, you could be in the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Sunday school, you could be vacation Bible school, you could be working with the housing association, uh, domestic violence, uh, ugly violence against uh, sisters and so forth. I don't like to dictate the particular choices people make. People have mm -hmm. to choose those, those, make those choices themselves, you see. But it's the spirit behind it and it's the standards that lure one. Yeah. I have a question here about public health. Um, in what ways do you feel as though the COVID-19 pandemic exposes and or exacerbates the disparities of low-income communities and communities of color within the United States? Well, it makes it much more difficult to deny the ugly, ugly realities because mm -hmm. people can see it for themselves. It's ripping the veil over a system that for so long has put low priority on poor and working people when it comes to health care. And uh, I, I hope that there's some kind of, of change. You just don't know. It depends on, again, the, the courage of the leadership and the quality of the vision of the leadership. But... There's no doubt that uh, this pandemic and the lockdown has exposed mm -hmm. just how feeble our system really is when it comes to poor and working people having access to quality health care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, someone asked, uh, I think, a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see, did I lose it? They were asking the difference with, um, for you to talk a little bit about um, the difference between inclusion and tokenism. They were speaking specifically about the film industry, but I think it mm. um, a 
applies, you know, to all institutions. Yes. Well, one, that inclusion means you are allowing others to come in in order to fit in. Mm -hmm. You're asking them to become adjusted. And if the status quo is unjust, which it often is, you're asking them to become well adjusted to injustice. Mm -hmm. Whereas transformation goes beyond inclusion. It says, when I actually get inside, I want to transform what is inside. Mm. I want to transform the very institution to the best of my ability inside. No one can do that all by themselves, but they'll know the witness that you bear, mm -hmm. the words that you raise, the courage you exhibit is cutting against the grain. It's not fitting in too well. And the last thing we need these days are tokens who are well adjusted to injustice. These questions are so coming so quickly. I'm trying to get them to you. Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm a fourth year medical student. And one thing that has really troubled me is my perception that I am less effective in connecting with and building relationship relationships with middle-aged black men. So this kind of question we were talking about, about intergenerational relationships. Mm. I'm a 20, 28 year old white medical student. And I find when I see patients over time, several appointments over weeks, um, but in one time interactions, I worry about this. I fear that the lack of um, strength in these relationships contributes to poor communication and care. I've asked mentors advice, but I'd appreciate if you had any other input for me. Thank you so much for your input today. Ooh, well, I appreciate that question. I mean, it's a hard question to, to answer, is. especially myself. I, it was light years ago I was middle-aged, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm young at heart, but I light years ago that I was middle-aged. And so there, there's different dynamics of the younger generations that I know not of. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter how much I try to embrace and include myself, there's just very different dynamics going on. I do believe, though, that there's still something common and constant about trying to treat people right. And no matter which generation, no matter what color they are, if you are sensitive, if you are open, if you are embracing, if you are humble, and if you are kind, mm -hmm there's a good chance that you'll find an opening in relating to another person in a serious and substantive manner. Yeah, I mean, I won't add to it. <laughs> so Dr. West, could you um, tell us what you think about Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem and contributions to black activism as the National Youth Poet Laureate? I think she's a genius, and I think that she exemplifies what we started our dialogue. Mm -hmm. She's a love warrior. She's a freedom fighter, and she is a wounded healer. She does it with her language. She does it with her poetry. Mm -hmm. She does it with her performance. And most importantly, she does it with her spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Younger generation, very young generation already doing it at a high level. It's amazing. It's a beautiful thing to behold. So here's a question. What is your, I think I know the answer, but what is your favorite thing to do? Just in life? Uh-huh. Well, that's what they asked. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I probably have to say talk to my mama. That's what I'm going to do right after this show. I haven't talked to her yet. That's probably the favorite thing in, in that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, of course, I spend a lot of time reading. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, your, your reading habit, listen, that four hours of reading a day, I wish I could every read every day, day for four hours. Every day I try to get in my four hours, you know that about that. Listen, you are my hero because I, <laughs> I wish I could read for four hours. I know you reading all the time too. Yes, all the time I do. I do. Um, so here's a question. I would like to know how you feel about Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday for the Black community. Well, because it's federal, it's for everyone, but um, 
for the black community in black America to celebrate. I like it. I like it. It'd be nice to get a little black history in outside of the uh, smallest month of the year, February. Mm -hmm. Have a little celebration in June. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I mean, I would also like to have June. Well, let me let it go. They asked you, not me. Um, <laughs> no, no, what were you going to say? Well, like what? Um, I mean, I think having a day off of work is good. I think more systemic approaches to um, addressing some of the disparities, I think that's better. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, that's true. So, But it's a starting place. Right. right, right, right. It's a um, symbolic, symbolic gesture. So someone asked, um, I've heard Dr. West mention a narrow view of hope. I may have missed it tonight, but um, can he expand a little bit more about what you mean by the narrow, narrow view of hope? Well, I was just making that distinction between hope and optimism. Mm -hmm. And I was blues, man, you're never optimistic. Never, ever, ever. So I have about two. You're never pessimistic either. You're a prisoner of hope. See, hope cuts deeper than both of them. So Dr. West, I'm going to ask you, because we only have a couple minutes before, um, before I need to bring someone else in, but how would you like, what is the last thought you would like to leave with us this evening? It would be that we must never forget that black people created the greatest modern tradition in the face of massive catastrophe generating high quality creativity and compassion now all oppressed peoples all around the world no matter what color have produced great traditions but in the modern world to be enslaved for 244 years and then neo-slavery for almost another 100 years and then after we break the back of american apartheid in the 60s then mass incarceration mm -hmm. mass wa wage stagnation so that the masses of black people still are on intimate terms with catastrophe in terms of poverty and so forth in the face of all of that, Black folk have done what? Created culture that the whole world has to take notice of. See, that's unprecedented. That's spiritual. And at its best is moral, profoundly artistic, with the music mm -hmm. and other manifestations of it, you see. Mm -hmm. And if Black folk can do that under those conditions, then no matter how difficult the conditions are now, and I tell young folk all the time, Brother West, I don't think I could make it. What do you think your great, great grandmama thought when she got up? How did she do it? Be in contact with, with her spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep keeping on. Keep fighting spiritually, morally, politically, economically. Be a decent person. Aspire to excellence. And most importantly, give of yourself. Mm. Dr. West, that's a beautiful place for us to pause um, for this evening. This, let me just tell you, it is always delightful when I get a chance to talk with you. <laughs> the College of Osteopathic Medicine celebrates. Thank you. Thank um, you and and we have State Representative Julie Brixey of the 69th House District who would like to honor you as well. Well, Dr. West, thank you so much for your incredibly inspiring words tonight. My heart and my soul have uh, been filled with just so much admiration and joy. Um, if we were in person, I have a tribute for you from the 101st Michigan Legislature. And if we were in person, I would hand you a framed copy, but I have mailed you a copy of this. And I'd just like to read a little bit of it. Um, in special recognition of Dr. Cornell West, let it be known that it is with the utmost respect and admiration that we honor you for your dedication and commitment to addressing racial, racial discrimination and for your leadership 
in the civil rights movement. You are such an inspiring individual who has touched so many lives through the countless hours you've dedicated to civil rights advocacy through your teaching at all the different universities. You've been a force for the understanding of race, gender, and religion in American society. In addition to all the books that you've written, your TV and podcast commenting, you've been featured in several documentary, in, in multiple documentaries, you've produced spoken word and hip hop albums. You were named once MTV's Artist of the Week and you were able to work alongside um, icons such as Prince and Gerald Lover. Your receipt of uh, more than 20 honorary degrees for your writing, your, your myriad of awards and your special recognition from the World Cultural Council are all some of the things that um, you have achieved. Given all of that, you were recently listed by Prospect as the fourth greatest thinker for the COVID-19 era in 2020 in recognition of your intellectual commentary on the pandemic. And we've heard a lot about that tonight. In special tribute, therefore, this tribute is signed and dedicated in special recognition of you, Dr. Cornell West, because your decades of work and tireless commitment to social justice have had an indelible impact on our nation. We thank you and hope that your efforts long continue to inspire uh, and um, to inspire others. So this is signed by our governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and our Lieutenant Governor, Garland Gilcrest, in addition to myself and our Senator uh, Curtis Hertel. Thank you so much for your participation tonight. Thank you, my dear sister, Representative Prixie. I appreciate you holding on until the very end. We were talking before. It's impressive a politician hold on to the very end. You are for real. You are heart, mind, and soul here. And we deeply, deeply appreciate it. And when you honor me, you honor my mother, my father, you honor my church, Shiloh Baptist Church, and you honor the tradition that I was talking about that goes all the way back through the quarters of time. Time Thank to you. be decent people. Thank you, sir. But the honor has truly been mine to hear your words of wisdom tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, my dear sister. Well, Dr. West, um, to all of our attendees, let me just say, it has been my honor to lead the 2021 William G. Anderson Lecture Series, Slavery to Freedom, an American Odyssey, uh, Odyssey and to be in community with all of you <laughs> during an extraordinary year of challenge and possibility. I am just truly overwhelmed by all of the affirmations in the chat boxes, the warm words of support in my inbox, the kind messages sent about how this series has enriched you this year. I open this month of reflections with Maya Angelou's words, that I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. I honor those who come before me and I honor those who stand with me. And before we leave this evening, I just want to express my gratitude. And I don't know that I could even begin to quite thank um, enough Dr. Christy Dotson, professor of philosophy, who is my mentor, who has been my mentor and is now such a great advisor and friend um, and thought partner. Um, and though I'm the first in this role in the College of Osteopathic Medicine, um, she saw what was possible in me, even when I didn't. And she pushed me to wed scholarship to practice in real ways that create possibilities for those who will follow. She created opportunities for me as I now try to create opportunities for my own students. And she continues to be a champion for me. She reminds me constantly that I am in this moment, both black history and the creation of black futures. So I want to be sure that I thank publicly Dr. Christy Dotson for all that she has done for me that has brought me to this moment. I also wanna thank all of our sponsors who helped make this series possible. 
in an absolutely extraordinary year, we have had an extraordinary series. I thank quite especially my Dean, Dr. Andrea Amalfatano, who supports my vision and shows up to partner with me in the work. We of course honor Dr. William Anderson for the creation of this series and for making space for these conversations. Finally, my deepest gratitude to the amazing Barbara Breedlove who has to put up with me <laughs> and for the team that works behind the scenes to make this happen, Devante Kennedy, Serena Gleason, and Pei Lu. For all of you that have joined us, thank you so much for welcoming us into your homes this year. Be well. We will see you next year. Dr. West, my extreme thanks. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, my dear sister. You were like Mary Lou Williams, and I was trying to keep blowing my horn while you worked it out on the piano. You conducted, you orchestrated in a marvelous way. Thank you so much. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. God bless you, indeed, indeed. All God right. Good night.